Welcome to Thinking Publicly. This is video two, I guess, for the day. Um, it actually sprung out of the last one that I'm in the process of posting right now that is some has material on the Bickle affair and also Christian nationalism and, well, the adulterous relationships between Christians in the world. Hmm. <clears throat> and what, what the Scripture explicitly teaches about it that is so violated in modern evangelicalism or, well, evangelicalism is a, is a non-functional word nowadays. Uh, but, um, yeah, it is not, our attitude toward the world is not at all biblical. We've, we've been misled by people like Billy Graham, to name perhaps the most well-known one with the what's technically called new evangelicalism or neo evangelicalism it is not evangelicalism in the historic meaning and without going to luther's meaning which is <laughs> they claim it for themselves luther called his preachers evangelicals because the gospel is the evangel so his evangelical preachers because they preach the gospel, which is the heart of evangelicalism, too, in the modern sense, the proper sense. It's about Christ and the gospel. You can pretty much leave everything else out. It's, it's not the centrality of Scripture, it's the centrality of Christ. Sometimes the Scripture becomes an idol for many people, especially a particular translation of the Scripture. Yeah. Don't go to one of those churches. If you got a church that a lot of churches use the King James, that's not a problem. It's when they preach the King James, preach that it is the exclusive only Bible that you have to use. Then that is a problem. It's uh, actually sinning against the Word of God because the Bible, the reason the Bible was translated in English was so we could understand it. And the King James is has reached the point where it is not in English anymore. It's in a ancient form of English now. So it doesn't fulfill the uh, purpose that the those that edited and uh, created the King James desire to have the Bible in English for the common people, for the church in their own language. Which is why uh, William Tyndale got himself burned at the stake because he provided the New Testament in English to the English people. So the king and the church burned him at the stake. Henry VIII, I believe. And of course he was the head of the church too. Yeah, we don't want to get into why that happened. But what I want to talk about really is, is uh, I was think, uh, talking about Chris Roseboro and his little Lutheran church up there in the borderlands. Uh, made me think back, and I think I've thought about this before. Since I have served as a pastor, what, what, would, what would I do if the Lord would call me and say, I want you to go to that little church over there. They happen to be Lutheran. And, and serve me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, what would I do? Without getting into the nitty-gritty and, uh, let's see, what else do I want to talk about? Uh, that. that. I'm going to stick, on that, stick with that. Because there's things I, had, I miss, and I've mentioned that, about Lutheran worship. I have to say the, the E, uh, the L, uh, what is it, the L, LCMS, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, which is, I've attended a couple times down here. We've got three Lutheran churches in the city, sort of city. City shrinking to town, I would say, uh, near me. And two of them are LCMS churches and one of them is an ELCA. And there's no way I would have anything to do with the ELCA. The building looks more familiar to what I'm used to, but no, it's not going to happen. Because it's got that denomination is utterly and completely apostate. Uh, there's they still may have some form, but it's it's apostate. <clears throat> the 
They've completely given themselves over to this world, to this current world in the United States. And we all know what that means. Yeah, the, the rainbow me means something else than uh, the promise of God to Noah and the world that he wouldn't destroy the planet with a flood again. It means something else to other people. It's strange that they have chosen the symbol of God's judgment. His judgment on the world. And his promise not to do it that way again. Hmm. <laughs> Why? Why did they choose the rainbow? Why did the judgment come for, for? Because the world had become so exceedingly wicked. Every thought and intention was only on evil continuously. And God was sorry he had created human beings. And he chose to save eight human beings out of a planet full. There could have been billions on the planet by that time. He chose to save eight and the animals that needed to be carried through the flood. And of course, with the genetic diversity God put into everything, and this was early in uh, the planet's history, only like 1,500 years old at this time, uh, you wouldn't have to have, you know, just consider dogs. All the different breeds of dogs that come from basically a generic dog. All right, so what I want to talk about is something much more pleasant, and that is, all right, so I, I really, you know, there's every denomination has its faults. Some of them have nothing but faults, but it's like as far as understanding the Bible, I probably fit best as a Baptist. I'm not utterly comfortable at that, and I'm certainly willing to go against things they say. It's like, uh, because there's all kinds of Baptists. Uh, John Bunyan, the writer of Pilgrim's Progress, was a independent Baptist, but he did not insist in baptism by immersion. If people wanted to join his church fellowship, he did not insist on that, and I agree with him. It's not about water. It's about Christ. It's about Christ. So <clears throat> that's what's important. Nothing else is important. Christ is important. If you have a living relationship with Christ, that's what's important. Not, not uh, at Baptists call them ordinances. I happen to agree. They're not, uh, they're not essential to salvation. Lutherans, I don't know. It depends on the particular brand. <laughs> so when I say that, you know, I miss, it's like the LCMS church down here, you could easily mistake it for a Roman Catholic Church walking in the door. Um, the only difference is the crucifix is front and center rather than in a typical traditional Catholic Church. Mary is front and center, and Jesus is off to the side someplace. That's typical there. How do you know that? Because I've been in a lot of those buildings up north and down on a border— and the closer you get to being outside the United States, the more superstitious and uh, middle evil they get. Uh, very superstitious. Uh, in the Rio Grande Valley, Catholicism is much closer to its true nature, which is uh, almost non-recognizable as Christian. <laughs> the superstition, the, the silliness, the people bringing empty jugs to the Basilica of San Juan to fill them up at the fountain with holy water, that kind of stuff, is real Catholicism in most of the world, especially Latin America. Farther north, the farther north you get, the more orthodox, shall we say, it has to become because it has to compete with Christians of various forms, and people that actually read the Bible instead of those that don't read the Bible. Catholics are allowed to read the Bible nowadays under controlled conditions, 
<laughs> but they typically don't. It's not essential to their faith. Okay, so I want to talk about specifically about Lutherans because I was raised as a Lutheran. And again, it was, um, I would say, a, a middle-of-the-road Lutheran denomination, a large denomination, the ALC. Uh, and the other one that was a little bit larger was the LCA, the Lutheran Church of America, which was, was the liberal side, the modernist side, more so. And then there was a small one, the I can't remember what the designation was in that, so those three joined together to, to form the, the, the big apostate body, um, and they rapidly went that direction. They were already, the a ALC was already going in that direction. So it was like within one generation, they crashed. Within a generation. My mother was raised in the old ALC, which was still pretty conservative. And what I saw was one well on its way to destruction. So I think she told me they had to memorize the large catechism. Yikes. That would have been a reason for me not to be catechized. Like, really? You got to be kidding. But, uh, there, what I do miss about Lutheranism, and the the LCMS, uh, was a culture shock compared to what I was raised in with with crucifixes and it looked just like it looks like you could, if somebody, it could almost fool a Catholic, until they would look around. Where's Mary? Where's Mary? And then it would almost fool a Catholic. I've even seen Mary in a modern Catholic church that was not front and center. It was, in fact, I, I did ask the very question, where's Mary? I knew she had to be here somewhere. It was sort of on a modern abstract carving in the back. That was strange. Actually, it was a church my in-laws belonged to. It was their new building. They had uh, built a school, and they met in the cafeteria of the school for years and years and years and years and years. And uh, I, it was only later, after we'd moved out of the area, that they had built their sanctuary. And I was in there probably for a funeral. Uh, and what I remember was, is it was strange. Uh, Mary was in a carving in the back and not in a normal form at all, just like a, a woman. And uh, that's that was really odd. That's not traditional Catholic. And usually she's front and center, right, in, right behind the altar, and Christ is on the side. <laughs> give, give me some, give me communion with Christ on the side. That's, uh, and I, I'm uh, very familiar with the, uh, Basilica de San Juan in San Juan, Texas, is down the Mexican border. A big church, and Mary is worshipped there. Worshipped there, you can say it's not worship; it's worship. Worship, worship, worship. You look at what the people are doing, not what the uh, the theologians tell you. So, if I were to ask them, what's the difference between? Uh, True worship and hyperdulia. Well, I forgot what the other word they use is. Uh, no. So the honor given to Christ and the honor given to Mary, what's the exact difference there? Mary's given more honor. More praise. She's central. Christ isn't. Typically. So that's, yeah. I don't know why I got onto that. Uh, Lutheranism is like reformed, moderately reformed Catholicism. The important thing was Luther got the gospel right, but he, he hung on to too much of the other stuff. I think his major error was holding on to the, uh, the, the mass 
in a, he still held to the Roman Catholic conception of the transubstantiation of the, the bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And technically, the Catholic Church teaches it's transformed into the body, blood, soul, and divinity. So it's the living Christ. And then you sacrifice him again by chewing him up. He just doesn't bleed. Oh, the, the congregation doesn't get the cup either, by the way, in case you didn't know that. I was surprised because I, was, I consented to be married in the Catholic Church. Uh, they might actually take that more serious than some other churches. I did not convert, of course, but I was already born again. Can't convert to anything after that. But the uh, uh, the the wet the married couple the couple being married gets the cup. I was shocked. I didn't know that. I don't have any problem. You know, that's it's like oh, are we get the real communion. Yeah, but. Uh, uh, Lutherans take communion more seriously. I'm, I'm rather, I'm not happy with the, the, the best church I can find, evangelical church, is this little Baptist, well, it's not that little, but it's the Baptist church over here. And, you know, you have to prioritize things. They preach the gospel. That, that's number one priority. There's so many that don't. <laughs> like the Nazarene church. It's like, no, they don't preach the gospel. They preach personal holiness. That's that's not the gospel. That will not save you. That will not save you. If you trust in that, you're you're not saved. There's going to be an awful lot of surprise Nazarenes. They've been trusting in uh, their their entire sanctification, the fact that they're sinlessly perfect, and they're going to find out the ju judgment seat of Christ. They're not. They're not, and they've been trusting in that rather than in perfection of Christ. As the pastor over there told me when I confronted him with this stuff out of their own literature, and I finally started doing some research to find out what's going on here. Something's not right. Something's missing, and the thing that was missing was Christ and him crucified. So uh, I confronted him. I, I said, well, do you believe in the imputed righteousness of Christ? That we're given his righteousness? I had to explain these terms, too, uh, which, which is understandable, but that we're given Christ's righteousness as a gift, uh, an alien righteousness, a, a righteousness that doesn't belong to us. It's not our righteousness, it's his that's given to us as our covering. He said, well, you're allowed to believe that. <laughs> but it's not really Nazarene doctrine. Oh, how generous of them. You're, you're allowed to be saved rather than to go to hell. Uh, because that's the difference. If you're trusting in your righteousness rather than Christ, dude, you're toast. You're toast. That's why it was, I had to confront them because it was, you, you know, you. he's preaching a false gospel. It's not a gospel at all. It, there was other small things that were troubling me, but then I, finally there's something really not right here. You know, you, it's just like, People can preach the Bible without preaching Christ. It is the gospel that saves, not the scriptures, the gospel. Preaching the message of the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, not preaching Daniel or Job or Psalms or anything else. If you're not preaching Christ, you're not preaching the gospel. And I've heard some Baptist ministers that say, well, the whole Bible is the gospel. They're ignorant. Ignorant preachers, they heard that at some Bible college or seminary. Somebody told them that. They didn't learn that out of the Scriptures. That's not just a Baptist issue either. But yeah, there's—but I, I do miss the, the uh, stateliness, the, the order, the seriousness of Lutheran worship. Catholics are even more serious than Baptists. The frivolity, the what they call fellowship, the the gab time. Everybody walk around the church and greet everybody else. Sometimes they actually do that in the service. 
frequently. Fundamentalists, Southern Baptists, sometimes they'll have 10 or 15 minutes to so, uh, set aside for, uh, greet everybody. Really? That's called fellowship? No, it's not. That's called noise and confusion. That's not worshiping Christ at all. That's not a Christian fellowship. It's not based in Christ. It's not about our fellowship in him, our koinonia. See, koinonia means fellowship. It means what we share in common. And what do we share in common as Christians? Regardless of your ethnicity, your color, your whatever, your age, your, your wealth, whatever, we share Christ. He is our koinonia. So Christian fellowship consists of worshiping Christ together and sharing in his table together. That is the meaning of Christian fellowship. And sharing together with each other when there are people in need in the congregation. That is Christian fellowship. Not gabbing together or eating burritos together. Or lutefisk. Well, no, that, that, no, Baptists don't have that sin. They don't have the sin of lutefisk suppers. Uh, that's a joke for some, some Lutherans. Some know what I'm talking about. Chris Roseborough knows. He got the, the, the wonderful experience of being, he's not, I don't believe uh, Chris is ethnically Scandinavian. I don't even know if this is a Scandinavian thing, but specifically a, a Norwegian thing. But Lutefist suppers are a typical fellowship supper in a Lutheran, Norwegian ancestry, ethnic Lutheran church. Uh, <laughs> you know, the woke crowd would probably look at that and say, that is a conspiracy among a white ethnic population to exclude other ethnic groups. Hmm, maybe, but I don't think so. It's just it's just very disgusting ethnic food that it's it's like the uh, the Passover meal, the Jewish Passover meal, there's the bitter herbs. It's the bitter herbs of the Passover meal. What it actually is is dried and salted cod that looks like a piece of wood. And then you, I think it's been soaked in lye. So why would they do that? Oh, to remove the fats. That's why they do it. I just, I just learned something. No, that wasn't divine inspiration, I don't think. That was just technical knowledge. Because fats are, fats don't, they go rancid. So if you remove the fat, the fish will stay, stay, I'm hesitant to use the word preserved when it comes to lutefisk, dried codfish. And what you do is you have to soak it to reconstitute it. It's like instant fish. But it's, it's what people had to eat. What, you do, what did you eat in the winter? You dried the fish, and that was what you, the protein you survived on during the winter. Uh, this was the days before refrigeration. My, my grandparents grew up without refrigeration. In fact, I think there was a point, they used to, in fact, their kitchen still had a place for getting, you'd buy ice. The ice man would come along and deliver a block of ice and you'd keep it in the cooler uh, to keep some food around for a while, you know, and melt in a couple days, and that was refrigeration <laughs> prior to. Uh, but if you're someplace else, like a, they had to dry fish when it, you dried, you preserved your food, you harvested your food, and you dried it, and that was the only way to preserve cod. The, the idea of salting fish as a preservative is not really true. It's mostly dried. And the salt actually took takes the moisture out too. The amount of you know, like I, I keep hearing preachers talk about salt in the Bible as being a preservative. 
The amount of salt you have to have for that is you basically have to pack the thing in salt after it's been cleaned and partially dried. And then it's almost non-edible. How do I know that? Because my grandfather used to buy some of that stuff. And, uh, it's, it's all smoked and salted and like, you know. Actually, I can even eat some of that stuff. It's tradition. It's, it's like the person that eats the super hot ghost peppers. That's what some Norwegian food is like, except it's not hot. We don't have things like spice in Norway. That stuff. Our stuff is bland. It's, it's soaked in butter instead. That's what you do instead of spice. So anyway, <laughs> that part of the world. Because there was dairy. I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't flat land to grow things on. So, uh, any, uh, what, this is on, I'm doing this on Lutheranism, aren't I? But, yeah, uh, the woke would look at that and say, oh, that's just a conspiracy to keep the, to keep the others out. Well, it, it might be, I'm trying to think, uh, there's, there's a longstanding feud, feud between Lutherans, uh, Norwegians and, and Swedish. The Norwegians don't like the Swedes because of the things Swede did to, the Swedes did to them in the past. And I was wondering, did Swedes eat Ludafis? Maybe might be a way to keep the Swedish Lutherans out of the Norwegian Lutheran Church. I'm I'm trying to be slightly humorous. I don't know. <laughs> people do strange things for strange reasons, and people do like to exclude others. I mean I I had an experience in a church where I was trying to get one of the uh, actually she lived right by the church a woman that lived in a trailer she was single with with a couple kids and you know obviously a welfare type kind of, kind of thing and not particularly well poor junky trailer uh, didn't usually mow our grass. I mean, I, I used to go over there and mow our grass, and I was trying to invite her to come to church. And the, the, the ladies in the church made it clear that these are not the kind of people we want in this church. And to my, my response to that is what it always is. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And if I was in a bad mood, I'd say sinners, even you. Which is would have been the proper response, I think. But yeah, that that's a very disgusting response. And another time, I was saying, "Well, I'm going to go to the trailer park and see if anybody would get anybody to come from there." And the response was, "We don't want trailer trash." So, is this a Christian church? Well, the sign said so. Literally. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> See, so you how do you how do you you can't build on that foundation. You have to have a regenerate church. A majority of the people have to be born again. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, no. Especially in a congregational church, because otherwise, the majority of the pop of the church simply doesn't want to go in that direction. You'll have to give them Joel Osteen and Rick Warren stuff. Then they'll like you. Uh, but back to uh, something that's uh, more important than that. The, the Ludafisk was an attempt, a poor attempt at humor, because Lutherans are, uh, Scandinavians have rather droll, subdued humor, and we have to, we tend to have subdued emotions too, although I get a little on the wild side. Why? Because you had to spend like six months in the year in total darkness <laughs> up there by the Arctic Circle. And if you were Italians, you never would survive to spring. <laughs> There'd be bodies in the cabin. Cabin fever. Yeah, it's the, the world turn, becomes utter darkness for <laughs> half of the year. Okay, so back to the uh, uh, issue of Okay, what do you do in an ethnic church like that? Lutherans are ethnic. I mean, you're Scandinavian. Maybe German. Scandinavians and Germans. That's the entire uh, 
area of Lutheranism, pretty much. Might bleed over into Finland a little bit, but that's really Scandinavia too. Where else does it go? That's about it. I mean, it's spread around the world now. I mean, there was even a Lutheran church down the Rio Grande Valley, and there's missionaries have taken it uh, to, you know, there's Lutheran churches in Africa and other places now. But still, it is uh, it is still a very ethnic religion, including the United States. Should it be that? Well, so what would happen if the Lord did something unusual and cruel? Again, bad humor. And assign me to pastor a Lutheran church, a small country church, you know, the kind of thing I could maybe be reasonably comfortable in. Boy, that would be a... Whew. I said, do I have to wear those dresses? Uh, not all Lutherans do that, by the way. There, there's a whole bod- bunch of different streams of Lutherans. I'm not even including the, 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 the ELCA. But there's small Lutheran churches. And uh, interestingly, there's charismatics. And I'm, I, I did attend a Lutheran charismatic church once in a while in sort of my hometown, Chainesville. Lived there more than other places usually. Family was from there, on and off. We moved around. My grand my grandparents were from there, not originally though. <laughs> this is America. This is, isn't like a place where this was our homeland. No, it's not. We're just passing through and around and out the other side. Maybe I don't know, but uh, uh, it's it spread around more now. But what what would uh, I remember going to a to my great uncle's funeral? up in the the wilderness near Minneapolis, out in the boonies. And it was a very quaint little, almost a chapel. Maybe that was a chapel, in fact, where they had his funeral. And it looked very Norwegian. Very, very Norwegian. Um, so you're talking about people that are often, I mean, I'm, I'm only third generation. My grandfather, who I knew for, you know, I, I think he was, till I was well into my 20s at least, uh, was immigrated in, here uh, somewhere around 1918, I think it was, 1919. And so not far removed. And it was a, he attended a Norwegian Lutheran church in my sort of hometown. So what do you do? What do you do if you end up? And this, this this would apply to other ethnicities too. Although the Spanish, I mean, they're they they're the almost the majority of the population now, <laughs> and increasing. And I actually, we took half their country. They have the right to take half of it back. I mean. I'm not terribly upset about that. Um, after what, what after what the United States did to Mexico, that's like payback. A little late, but it's still payback. Uh, actually, in Mexico, they call it the the. Let's see if I can get my R. I'll just forget that the trilled R, the Reconquesta, the reconquest of the northern half of Mexico. You know, uh, Oregon, California, Nevada, Arizona, Texas, whatever else is in that triangle on the southwest. They're just taking it back. There's a joke down in Mexico, too. As I said, this is just a fun video. Uh, that uh, it, it goes like this. The, and, and it actually uh, exemplifies there's a love-hate relationship toward the United States in Mexico. And it actually pictures that. It says, it talks about the the the, the, the evil America that, that they took half of our country. They took half of Mexico. That's the first statement. The punchline is, why didn't they take it all? That... Yep, that circulates in Mexico. 
And it's it's really funny too, and it fits right in with 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 Mexico. You could it fits. I mean, it really. This is a serious joke too. It's not really a joke because I mean they want to come here for lots of reasons, not just money. the the, the government in Mexico is corrupt, and and it's it's like the the. the uh, the government in Mexico has been so hostile toward Catholicism for, well, how long? Maybe two centuries. Uh, the French took it, took Mexico over once upon a time, and it was just they. How many revolutions? How many Independence Days do they actually have in Mexico? I don't know. I think it's like two or three. Independence from this and independence from that. And, So, and the people that come here are are really the best of the not the most law abiding, but the best of the Mexican population. Of course, a lot of people come from farther south than Mexico too. Uh, but the most enterprising, they come here. And when I was down there, you could not legally work in the United States without a visa and work permit. So they would, but you could start your own business. So these taco stands and everything else would just spring up. They had the best authentic Mexican food. You had a whole variety from all different areas in Mexico just within two miles of us. And, you know, they didn't speak English, of course. But you had to make sure you had everything fastened down well, especially in some areas, because they're coming across the, the river with nothing. And they have no means of of survival unless they have family up here. And it's, it's well, a little difficult. But I'm not really upset about that too much. I mean, lots of people are crazy about that. I don't care. I really don't care. Uh, they, may hear, they might actually hear the gospel here. They probably, well, there's a fairly strong evangelical population in Mexico now. But, uh, yeah. Okay, back to ethnic, ethnic churches. And there's ethnic Mexican churches, of course, Spanish churches. But uh, since I was raised as a Lutheran, I'll deal with that. If, if I if I had to jump into that place, like Chris Roseborough, because he's not originally a Lutheran as far as I know. I don't believe he is. I don't think he's Scandinavian. Because I was joking with him about Lutefus Supper, so he, he, he learned. He had to... to uh, it's like if you're going moving in a different area, let's say like a missionary or something like that, like down to the Mexican border, you have to make yourself fit in. It, it's work. You have to to try to adopt and appreciate the local cuisine and learn the language and you know fit yourself in. As Paul said, I, I become like all men that I might win by all means win some. So you adopt yourself to the local environment. but uh, So that's what you'd have to do in his case, becoming a Lutheran pastor and a, uh, I'll say Scandinavian, but that's, a, that's pretty safe, church out there in that area. So what do you do? I mean, you're, you're a pastor, so say, and how do, you, how do you deal with the reality of modern America? Uh, again, a, an ethnic group, it's usually the first generation struggles. But they don't want their children to retain that. They they don't want their children say to, to continue speaking, their parents' native tongue. They want their children to learn English. They want their children to be be able to get ahead, and they want their children to become Americans, which is probably a mistake nowadays. But yeah. You know. So there there's different pressures. So in a church like that, there's things. And I've done things wrong in the past. So I thought, what would I do again? Uh, it's in some ways I've done things wrong in a situation like that because there's things that are worth saving and things that aren't. You've got Lutheranism, which is right on the gospel, but it's a little bit dicey on the sacraments. It's not clear. Are you saved by sacraments or are you saved by faith in Jesus Christ? And that's one of the things that's a problem with it, this this double-mindedness that exists in it, uh, almost universally. 
Um, and if you're, say, Norwegian, uh, that's the heritage of the church, and it's still the dominant culture in the area, what do you do? Well, you have to remember that Christ came to save sinners. So if I was in that situation, I would approach it this way. I have a two-track approach. One, we're going to save, hold on to the heritage, but not close out others. And this is exactly the problem I have with the uh, LCMS church here locally, and I've talked to the pastor about this, and he can't change it. So, I think if he had his druthers, he'd probably, I, I could beat him in a debate on it. He, he knows it. He knows it. We've, we've talked in theological depth in a period of about 15 minutes on this, but he knows he has no scriptural ground. So he, he would, if it was up to him, he would probably say, well, let's see, well, how can we arrange this? So, uh, and of course, keep, keep uh, serious. Keeping it serious is the issue. But the a precise metaphysical definition of how Christ is present in the elements of communion. What do you mean? Why does he have to be present in the elements anyway? Uh, because it goes back to Luther. Say so it's it's part of that. But Luther was wrong on many many things, and Lutherans would say Luther was wrong. Uh, they don't hold to some of Luther's ideas. So there's no real, you know, Luther said Scripture alone. Follow him on that. Follow him where he was right, and don't follow him where, we, where he was wrong. But there is a, you know, the, 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 because, you know, I've pastored in a church where it was, people there, it was basically a family church where you had families that went back to the original founders. It was a country church, you had some farmers, and, and they're, the church goes back to the middle of the 19th century, and there, you know, that uh, you have the problem as a pastor coming from outside of okay, this is a shrinking population, and you have large churches in competition that are easy within easy car distance, you know, within within uh, 10 to 15 miles or less, five miles or less. What do you do? I mean, why should the church even exist? Well, you got traditions. Jesus talked about a scribe that takes, brings forth things old and things new. And I think that's what you have to do in hindsight. <laughs> in hindsight is make sure you have the essentials of the gospel the essentials of Scripture. Christ has to be center. There is no worship without him front and center. But then the traditions that are valuable uh, at, because they link you with the past and a heritage, but don't interfere with the gospel. You can preserve them. But make sure you're not closing other people out that don't hold those traditions. So they have to be, you know, just the ancestry of the church, basically. But outsiders aren't shut out at all. You have, it has to be the church of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean we have to erase the past. But handle it in such a way that it doesn't interfere with being the church of Jesus Christ. So, you know, things like, like in Lutheranism, like like the Ludafist Supper, okay. Well, do a taco supper or something too, or you know something that's Ludafisk is serve other things if they want to try the Ludafisk. Okay, make sure you have like Swedish meatballs or something too that anyone could eat and enjoy. Uh, so if you want to, you, you can keep it Scandinavian as. Make sure you have some lefse. You know, if you're going to do the traditional foods, make sure it has the good stuff along with the bad. So they can try that. And they'll love it. They'll love lefse. I mean, how can you, uh, it, uh, how can you beat a, a mashed potato tortilla 
So you, you usually make those with leftover mashed potatoes. I never made lefse. My grandmother did. She even bought me a lefse griddle. I never used it for that because I love leftover mashed potatoes too much to use them for that. So you make this, uh, like, mashed potatoes with some flour, I think, in there, and you roll it out, and you, gr you grill it like a tortilla. So it's, it's very much a potato tortilla. And then what you do, by itself, it's just a potato tortilla. But then you have to spread some butter on it, a layer of butter, a thin layer spread more or less evenly. And then you sprinkle sugar all over the top, and then you roll it up and eat it. That's edible, <laughs> very edible. Uh, but uh, And some of the cookies and everything else. But the, uh, the, the, the lutefisk is, well, it's edible. But So what do you do with the dried cod? This is educational, I guess. This will be an educational video. So you reconstitute it and boil it. And if it's good cod, it doesn't stink too bad. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's how you could tell. According to my grandfather, if it doesn't stink too bad, it's good. He would have he would have grown up with a real thing. Maybe that's why he left Norway. I don't want to eat that all winter long. But uh, then you 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 boil it, and it becomes very gelatinous and flavorless, and has like, like a gelatinous characteristic. It's like really mushy, colorless, jelly-like fish. At that point, because everything's been taken out of it by the lye and then washing it, soaking it, and boiling it. But what you do is you take a, a scoop of mashed potatoes. It has to be big enough. Uh, and then you create a crater in it, and then you put a ladle of lutefisk in there, and then you take a full ladle of melted butter, and you pour it all over the top and add a bunch of salt. And that's how you eat lutefisk at a lutefisk dinner. Uh, it's it's like the bitter herbs to remind us of our bondage in the old country. Okay, where I never was, but I heard about it somewhat. Uh, so what do you do with that? Well, you make sure you don't lock people out of the church because of your traditions. You serve something with the lutefisk <laughs> that's edible and not to remind them because it doesn't fit their heritage. It's not relevant to them. It has to be a church for Christ, for Jesus Christ, for all people. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples, all the nations, all ethnic, ethnic groups. So you have to have a church where they can be welcome as welcome as you are. With, you don't have to eliminate your heritage, but you have to incorporate everybody else too. The, 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 who built the church isn't relevant other than Christ built the church. That's what's important. So he has to be front and center. And anything that, that interferes with this, it's like Lutheranism. I would try to move it in a direction that using, I could use Luther to do this too. So you'd have to show the congregation, um, You'd have to emphasize what's right and good and de-emphasize what's a problem. So it's like the sacraments, you have to treat them, first of all, biblically. What does the Bible say about these things? And I would certainly point out the problems with the particular metaphysical or any metaphysical interpretation and try to reveal what the Scripture actually says, and just say, okay, this is what it is. We treat it seriously because the Bible treats it seriously. But to try to require people to have a particular understanding that has no grounding in Scripture at all, other than Luther's argument, this is my body, and is, 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 is. Well, I'm sorry, Luther. Your, is, your Greek was not sufficient on that. See, he dragged in uh, Roman Catholicism. He was he was a Roman Catholic. He was an Augustinian friar. So he he was raised in that stuff. 
And he couldn't let go of some of it. And that was one of the things he couldn't let go of. You don't have to let go of it completely, but you have to conform it to the Scripture. Luther said, Scripture, Scripture, Scripture. Well, you have to pick up where Luther didn't go to then and say, yeah, Luther just didn't have the time to deal with some of these things. He wasn't perfect, as we all know. If anybody knows anything about Luther, you know he wasn't perfect. No, he had a personality. Some people might say he had a personality disorder, but not quite that bad. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he'd, he'd, just, he'd just have his day on Twitter. Oh, Luther would have so much fun with Twitter. He'd be, he would be tweeting the Pope all day long with nasty little memes. He, he was doing that in the 1500s. Uh, so, but again, it, it, it has to be Christ, the centrality of Christ. And Lutherans are pretty good at that. I mean, the Orthodox Lutherans. Keeping Christ center, keeping the cross center. In, in that way, they've been much more reliably uh, evangelical in Luther's sense, too, as, as evangelical as uh, preaching the, evan the evangel, the gospel. Their worship's not bad, and I don't think there's a problem with liturgical. I, I think liturgy has certain advantages. Of course, liturgy goes way, way back to at least the second, third century. Uh, an order of worship, it, it makes the pastor less important. I think there's way too much pastor-centered in, uh, say, Baptists. Uh, why do I say that? Because in a f regular liturgy, the congregation participates much more. Responsive readings, uh, you know, the, usually the, the pastor reads a line, and then the congregation reads a line as part of the liturgy all the way through, just like in Roman Catholicism except it doesn't have Mary and this other stuff in there. So the congregation is as involved in the service as the minister is, which is the normal term for in Lutherans, I think, is a, uh, a minister, even if he's just dressed like a priest. That's not necessary. I mean, th those kinds of things can go. Um, the Some of the, like the, the crucifix, I'm sure the LCMS does not require that. I'm sure they don't require uh, glass or the garments. I hope that would be why. There's no biblical grounds for that. Uh, I always, when I was serving as pastor, I always tended wanted to diminish myself. I usually, like one church, they had the chairs up front for the for the elders and the deacons and the pastor, you know, center chair for the pastor, the throne. I never sit in that. I usually sit in a, a pew in the front and then walk up. Why? Because I'm just a member of the congregation. I'm not special. That's, And I wanted to live that thing. I don't, a priesthood of all believers. Uh, that doesn't mean the people necessarily want it that way, but it's, that's the way the Scripture presents it. We should not exalt ourselves. We should humble ourselves, deliberately seeking that, not to raise ourselves over others, but just be a servant, just be a, uh, an elder in a biblical sense, uh, somebody that's able to teach, that knows the Scripture well, and is, has a certain amount of wisdom, which I didn't have a whole lot then <laughs> in hindsight. But uh, I didn't know the Lord Jesus, which was more than a whole lot of people a whole lot of ministers that I've seen in my life, including that were in the denomination or association that they were hooked up with, as I've never seen. I think there were some I think I just got glommed onto by the wrong people. Uh, but I never went go, would go back to that thing for a meeting. No, no way. No way. I don't want anything to do with that. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I... You know, I, I, I do miss the elements that were there were more serious worship. I think that was it. And I would consider 
even the local church I'm considering, well, maybe I could go down there for a Wednesday night service or something like that, which is certainly better than going to a prayer meeting and Bible study at Baptist church. Uh -uh. So I don't fit anywhere well. I'm sure some of you feel the same way. You don't feel fit anywhere well. But yeah, there. I think there are, now, of course, the congregation would have to want that. A lot of times these congregations are so small. Uh, see, when I, of course, I was so green. This church that was near here where I served as pastor for a bit in the 90s, they said when I came, you can change things. We're open to change. And I said, well, let me just see how you do things, and then I'll, you know, if I think of something. I should have taken advantage of that offer. But I wasn't. I didn't have the experience. This was the first place I ever was like the pastor. I, I served a little bit as a sort of a pastor, a homeless shelter, but this was, you know, as a sort of leader of the church. Uh, it was, uh, biggest problem is I think a lot of the people weren't really born again. Uh, it was because of their heritage. It was, yeah didn't think they really knew what, what it meant to be born again. But that's true in so many churches. Southern Baptists, same way. Even many fundamentalist Baptists aren't born again. It, they don't know what it is. It depends a lot on the church. Uh, many evangelicals are not born again. They're not. They're just not. They, they grow up in the church. They know the motions. They know the right words. They're told, say these words, and you're a Christian. Just like Church of Christ, just just do these things and get baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Has to be for the forgiveness of your sins, and then you're a Christian, unless you sin, and then you're not a Christian until you repent. And <laughs> really, <laughs> what kind of salvation? They don't have salvation. Church of Christ, there, there, there's, there's some that I think are preaching more of the gospel nowadays, but traditional churches of Christ don't have salvation. Luther, if you emphasize the right things, and then they have spanner in their tradition and uh, aren't, and the the Lutherans were very much more evangelical in the the nineteenth century here until the Civil War, which burned them out. But I would I would look at their heritage and say, what can I, what can we hold on to, and maybe emphasize some things and de-emphasize others and get get the congregation to to buy into being the church of Christ and being open to others and minimizing things that might inhibit that openness and fellowship with others uh, that need Christ or others that are Christians in the community that there's not a you know to be a to be the church of Jesus Christ we have to be his church without just unnecessary destruction. And Luther was with that, too, because he didn't want to necessarily destroy all the images and everything else. He was sort of upset with some of the fanatics that he, was around him that did that. Uh, I'm not sure how much of that was wise. Given the environment, yeah, it might have been. I mean, you have to trust this, this God to lead you. You have to trust God to lead you in those things because Satan's not going to be helpful at all. And it, it does, you know, it's... I'm much more concerned with the church being fixed than this stupid nation being fixed. The only way to fix it would be to castrate it. That would be a fix. what this country has done and is doing. you got to look at the bad, not just the good. And the good is rapidly disappearing. So we can't trust in the, that, that, that is This is of the world. We're not here to fix the world. We're here to proclaim Christ. And that is has to be, uh, as a pastor, a good pastor of the Lord Jesus Christ, to, to bring up the congregation so that as a congregation we proclaim Christ. 
And that doesn't involve silly things like ice cream socials necessarily. I mean, not unless you make it specifically. I mean, I, I'm not totally against that stuff if Christ is kept front and center uh, and not just get people to come and see the church, you know, Christ front and center. If you're going to invite them for something like that and introduce them, let them see the church and, and give some handouts and doctrine and give them a New Testament and tell them what the gospel really is, that then it would be, I'd be okay with that. I would be okay with that, as long as we kept Christ front and center. And eliminate barriers, you know, like the attitude that we, we don't want tra trailer trash here. Why, don't they need to be saved? Didn't Christ come to save sinners? Aren't you people telling me they're sinners? That's why you don't want them, because they're sinners? Uh, so who are you working for? Yeah, uh, that, that kind of stuff does exist. It certainly does exist out there. And uh, there are also problems with uh, people that don't want others to come because they want to protect their what they got. They're afraid immigrants, so to speak, will dilute them. Immigrants to their church will dilute what they are and what they have and their control over it. Yeah, that's I've learned about that, too. Oop, I've got something blocking the screen here, don't I? Yeah, there we go. So, uh, let's see, what am I doing on time? Oh, an hour. That's more than enough. So, I don't know if this will help anybody. I know there's some pastors out there that probably find themselves in similar situations. And again, this isn't about Lutheranism necessarily. It's about something, you know, you could apply these principles anywhere. If you're coming into a small church or any church, but if, don't go to a big church. If you're if you're going out there looking for a place with a large salary and health insurance and everything else, you're not doing it to serve Jesus Christ anyway. You're not. You have to go willing to trust him to provide your needs the way he chooses to. If you're going there to... Uh, as part of, this is my career, this is what I do for a living, then go do something else. You're not one of the Lord's shepherds. You can't, you can't seek that. You can't seek the things of the world and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot serve God and money, God and mammon. You can't. And be willing to humble yourself. Do the least, the lowest task. Because that's what Jesus calls his disciples to do. To do the to do the, the job of the the lowest servant in the household. Which is what washing feet is all about. It's not about literally washing feet. There are those that make that into a sacrament too. <laughs> Something tells me they don't understand it. Just like the argument about this is my body and oh this means the bread becomes this and this. That is such a foolish, childish argument. I don't care if they are using Aristotelian metaphysics. It's still a foolish, childish argument. It means they don't understand what they're doing. All you have to do is look in Scripture. Look to the Lord for wisdom and understanding, and he'll give it to you. So this might be of some use to somebody out there. <laughs> I wish I had known these things some years back. It would have been helpful. I don't have to do that right now. Who knows? Who knows? I belong to the Lord. I don't know what he's going to do. He doesn't tell me in advance his plans. <laughs> uh, I remember the story of Jonah, and I'm not saying I might not do that. I don't think I would. But I, I mean, I've had enough experience that I realized you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me as long as I'm doing what he really wants me to do. If I call myself to do something, well, then I'm on my own. 